fluid surrounding the cells in the body must maintain a specific concentration of electrolytes for the cells to function properly. Let's look more closely at how electrolyte homeostasis is maintained in the body. Aldosterone also has an effect on potassium. Potassium is filtered at the glomerulus. About 90% of potassium is reabsorbed in the PCT and loop of Henle. The kidney handles sodium and potassium differently. While the remaining sodium can get reabsorbed in the late distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, the remaining potassium never gets reabsorbed. It will always be excreted in the urine. If the plasma level of potassium is high, aldosterone is secreted from the adrenal gland. Drag the potassium ion to where it will go in the presence of aldosterone. Remember that aldosterone causes potassium secretion. Remember that aldosterone causes potassium secretion. In the presence of aldosterone, excess extracellular potassium is secreted into the filtrate from the plasma within the late distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, and even more potassium ends up in the urine. To summarize, aldosterone is secreted from the adrenal gland when angiotensin II is present and or when potassium levels are high. The effect of aldosterone is to reabsorb sodium into the plasma and secrete potassium into the filtrate within the kidney. By promoting urine formation, some diuretics will cause a potassium deficiency. Drag the potassium ion to where it will go if a person is deficient in potassium. The 10% of potassium ion that is not reabsorbed in the PCT remains in the urine. Potassium deficiency cannot be corrected without ingesting additional potassium. One reason why a low plasma potassium concentration or hypokalemia is clinically significant is because there is no mechanism to compensate for renal losses of potassium. The normal range of sodium in the plasma is 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. Compare this range to the normal range of potassium in the plasma, which is 3.5 to 5.1 milliequivalents per liter. Because potassium has a much smaller range, the loss of a small amount of potassium can make a significant difference in the body. Although most potassium is found inside cells, its concentration is measured in the plasma. It ends up in the extracellular fluids in two ways. Like water and sodium, potassium is constantly entering the body in food and leaving the body mostly through the urine. Because the cell membrane is more permeable to potassium than sodium, more potassium leaks out of cells. Let's look at the roles of potassium in the body. As the major intracellular positive ion, potassium is responsible for intracellular fluid volume through osmosis. What would happen if there was a slight increase in potassium ions in the extracellular fluid? Cells will shrink slightly due to osmosis. Because most cells in the body leak potassium, but not other ions, potassium will leave the cells through ion channels. Notice that a significant amount of positive charge is leaving the cell. What charge will be left inside the cell? A negative charge is present inside the cell. Potassium plays a key role in maintaining resting membrane potential and therefore a major role in nerve impulse conduction, 
muscle contraction, and maintenance of normal cardiac rhythm. Potassium also plays a role in acid-base balance. As hydrogen ions move into and out of the cells in the body, there is a corresponding movement of potassium in the opposite direction by ion transport proteins that link hydrogen ion movement to potassium ion movement. This movement helps maintain electrical balance inside the cells. In acidosis, there is an excess of hydrogen ions which determines the pH in the extracellular fluids. The hydrogen ions exchange for potassium ions, increasing the extracellular potassium level. Hyperkalemia occurs if the plasma potassium level is greater than 5.1 milliequivalents per liter. Hypokalemia occurs if the plasma potassium level is less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. Predict whether or not the following conditions would cause hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. Click the correct button for each. Excessive intake of potassium, such as overuse of salt substitutes. Eating too much potassium can lead to too much potassium in the extracellular fluid. Eating too much potassium could lead to hyperkalemia. Alkalosis. In alkalosis, hydrogen ion comes out of the cells in exchange for potassium ion. The potassium ion in the extracellular fluid decreases, leading to hypokalemia. In alkalosis, hydrogen ion comes out of the cells in exchange for potassium ion. The potassium ion in the extracellular fluid decreases, leading to hypokalemia. Taking diuretics. Correct. Some diuretics can cause too much potassium to leave the body through the urine, resulting in hypokalemia. Decreased ability of the kidneys to excrete potassium, such as occurs in renal failure. The failure of the kidneys to excrete potassium may cause hyperkalemia. A decreased intake of potassium, such as in an unbalanced diet. Because the body absorbs potassium through food and beverages, a poor diet could cause hypokalemia. Severe vomiting or diarrhea. Loss of potassium ion from the GI tract may lead to hypokalemia. Loss of potassium from the body leads to hypokalemia. Acidosis. In acidosis, potassium leaves the cells in exchange for hydrogen ion, resulting in hyperkalemia. Because potassium plays a pivotal role in maintaining membrane potential, the effects of both hyperkalemia and hypokalemia are reflected in changes in neuromuscular functioning. Mild hyperkalemia may cause intestinal cramping, diarrhea, restlessness, and changes in the patient's electrocardiogram. Severe hyperkalemia may cause muscle weakness progressing to paralysis, slowed heart conduction, and cardiac arrest. Hypokalemia causes symptoms of decreased neuromuscular excitability, which can cause skeletal muscle weakness and cardiac dysrhythmias. If hypokalemia continues untreated, the skeletal muscle weakness may progress to respiratory arrest. Calcium homeostasis is crucial to normal body function. Even small changes in calcium concentration can be deadly. Normally, total calcium level in the plasma varies between 9 and 11 milligrams per 100 milliliters. Move the needle on the meter to hypercalcemia to see what happens when there is too much calcium in the extracellular fluids. If the level of calcium gets too high, heart dysrhythmias can occur. Other symptoms of hypercalcemia include fatigue, confusion, nausea, coma, cardiac arrest, and calcification of the soft tissues. 
the heart can stop if the calcium level gets too high. Move the needle on the meter to hypocalcemia. If the level of calcium gets too low, muscle spasms can occur. When the calcium level is very low, a person can go into tetanus due to a lack of calcium available to trigger release of neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. If the calcium level goes too low, breathing will stop. As you can see, it is very important to maintain calcium levels within a specific range. Approximately 99% of the calcium in the body resides in bone as a salt, and about 1% is dissolved in the extracellular fluids. When levels of plasma calcium get too high, the thyroid gland may sense the high calcium concentration and may release calcitonin hormone into the blood. The target tissue of calcitonin is bone. Calcitonin inhibits the action of osteoclasts, which break down bone, and stimulates osteoblasts, which cause bone formation. This process accelerates the uptake of calcium and phosphate into bone matrix. The osteocytes, seen here, maintain bone tissue. The net effect of calcitonin is a decrease in plasma calcium and phosphate concentrations. Calcitonin appears to be a hormone more important in children than adults. When levels of plasma calcium get too low, the parathyroid gland senses the low calcium concentration and releases parathyroid hormone. One of the target tissues of parathyroid hormone is bone. In bone, parathyroid hormone increases the number and activity of osteoclasts, releasing calcium ion and phosphate into the plasma. The other target tissue of parathyroid hormone is the kidney. Click the parathyroid gland to see what happens there. In the kidney, parathyroid hormone increases the uptake of calcium ion. It also inhibits reabsorption of phosphate by the kidneys, causing greater phosphate excretion in the urine. Parathyroid hormone also promotes the activation of dietary vitamin D into the hormone calcitriol in the kidney. The liver is also involved in the activation of vitamin D. Calcium absorption from the small intestine can be quite variable and is influenced by calcitriol, which increases the rate of calcium ion and phosphate absorption from the gastrointestinal tract. Click the arrow that indicates what would happen to calcium ion as a net result of parathyroid hormone secretion. Plasma levels of calcium increase to normal. When the plasma calcium level returns to normal, parathyroid hormone secretion slows, which is the final step in this negative feedback loop. Here's the summary of what we've covered. To maintain homeostasis, the extracellular fluid must maintain specific concentrations of electrolytes for the cells they bathe to function properly. One important function of electrolytes, particularly sodium, is to control fluid movement between the fluid compartments. Sodium and potassium balance are maintained by the kidney through the hormone aldosterone. Calcium balance is maintained by parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, and vitamin D. To test your knowledge, click the quiz button to go to the self-quiz.